welcome back for Beauty and the Beast, Your Code and Distributed Systems by Emily Stolfo. Um, she works at Elastic, maintaining their Ruby client and Rails integrations project. She is an adjunct faculty at Columbia University, and she's a long distance runner and loves making sourdough bread. That's pretty cool. Currently stationed in Berlin, but she came to Europe all the way from New York today. That's her on stage. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily, and I am going to give a talk called Beauty and the Beast, Your Code and Distributed Systems. I'm a Ruby engineer at Elastic. Um, who uses Elasticsearch or a product of Elasticsearch? OK, that's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of different products, uh, Logstash, APM, Elasticsearch, machine learning. Um, I actually work on the clients team, which is a team of people who code in different languages, um, libraries that can be used for Elasticsearch server itself. Uh, so we don't work on the other products. We work on like the pure server, the kind of core technology around which a lot of the other products at Elastic are built. But I actually um, used to work for MongoDB for uh, six years on the client's team there. Um, so I have a lot of experience with distributed systems. And the reason I wanted to give this talk was um, for two reasons. One, um, I've, so for almost seven years now, I've been interacting with, um, I think, is there, it's my earrings. <laughs> I'm going to take them off. <laughs> I think that'll resolve the, OK, now I look like Captain Hook. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was, yeah, um, anyway, thank you for pointing that out, because I was like, what does that sound? Um, anyway, what was I saying? So the reason I want to give this talk is uh, twofold. First, I've spent seven years interfacing with a community of people. It's all open source, so everybody um, can see my code and use my code, because they're in the form of gems. And uh, w writing code that interfaces with a distributed system. So in um, uh, resolving issues and, and communicating with the community, I've uh, noticed that with an extra set of knowledge around the theory of distributed systems, application developers would be able to write more clever and intelligent code that uses the distributed system. So that's one portion that I, I noticed that there, over the years that there might be some gaps in knowledge, and if we fill those with theory, then people might be able to understand the errors that they get from the distributed systems and write more resilient code. The second reason is because I've noticed a trend in the way that people write applications. So applications today are a lot of times broken up into many different components. They're very complex. They're, they're pinging 1,000 APIs. It's basically Willy Watkins' chocolate factory going on. So the, the, the applications themselves are becoming much more complex and resemble, in a way, a distributed system. So with some extra distributed systems theory knowledge, people would be able to write applications in a more um, coherent and uh, clever way. I'm also an actual faculty at Columbia University, where I've taught courses on web development, specifically Ruby on Rails. Most recently, I wrote a um, I gave a class on NoSQL databases, so I, I um, did kind of a survey of different NoSQL databases and compared um, some to others and showed use cases and when it might be more appropriate to use one over another. I'm originally from New York, so I didn't, um, I actually didn't uh, travel all the way here from New York because I live in Berlin. I've lived there for five years and I love it. And I'm the maintainer of these gems, which um, Amongst all of them make up the uh, pure Ruby offering for using Elasticsearch, as well as the Rails integrations. And if you who's used MongoDB or who uses MongoDB? OK, I'm working for the right company because there are more Elastic users. <laughs> uh, just kidding. hope this isn't recorded. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I maintained Mongoid at um, MongoDB for a long time, and I co-wrote the Ruby driver. So um, those gems, Mongo, Bison, and Mongoid, I've also um, had my hands in. Um, so let's get started. This is my friend, Bear. He's from Berlin, and he's an application developer. And he falls into this camp that I just described, um, application of an application developer who has a highly complex application that resembles, in a way, a distributed system. 
And he also interfaces with MongoDB in Elasticsearch. So with some extra knowledge around the theory of distributed systems, he can write a more robust application and more resilient code. So the thing about Bear is that he thinks distributed systems are simple. And in a way, they are, but they're actually very complex. So let's look at an example of his code. So this is pretty simple, right? This DB object, DB, is, um, is retrieved from the, the gems that I work on. So this, the, the Elasticsearch gem, the MongoDB gem, will make a DB object available to you, database object. And you can use it to ping the database. And if you get a positive response back, then you can assume, or Bear assumes, that this database is available, and he can do an insert. And it's fine. It'll work 100% of the time. So that's, that's a more simple view of the distributed system. But actually, in reality, it's quite complex, in that the distributed system kind of has a mind of its own. The same code, db.ping, what could happen between the ping, there are two requests to the distributed system. So anything can happen, anything. There could be a hurricane, the, the network could go down, someone could spill coffee on the server, the distributed system could choose a new primary, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything could happen because there are two separate requests that are no way related. So for example, an election for a new primary can start between the ping and the write. So then Bear would get an error back from the distributed system, from, in this case, the database, saying that whatever server it originally thought it could write that, that request to cannot accept that request because it's in the process of an election, and there's nobody available to take that request. So what Bear needs to know is that distributed systems are complex, but they are designed so your code can be simple. So that's what I mean by they're both simple and complex. But understanding the complexity allows Bear to write simple code that can anticipate the behaviors of the distributed system. And furthermore, as I said, Bear's application itself, as I said, is kind of like a zoo in there, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, contacting all these APIs, making background, uh, like uh, building a background worker queue that's sending emails, um, et cetera. Uh, his application actually resembles a distributed system itself, shares some characteristics. So with some extra knowledge, his application is both a beauty and a beast, and he'll be able to, to control that and anticipate that. So this talk is going to be um, an education of Bear, and it's divided into two parts. The first part is going to be theory about distributed systems. And then the second part, we're going to look at Bear's code and see how we can apply his new knowledge of distributed systems to that code to make it more resilient. So the beast. We're going to define a distributed system. It's going to be kind of like classroom style in the, the beginning of this talk. We'll define some concepts with distributed systems and um, expand Bear's knowledge of them. And then we're going to skip security because I frankly don't not know that much about it. And it's a whole talk in itself. It's very complex. Um, and then we're going to turn over to the beauty side. So we'll look at his code, the errors that he's going to get, how he can anticipate them, retry behavior, how he can build that into his application. We'll look at the gems he uses and um, uh, the gems that I work on and what I make available in my gems to Bear so that he can write more resilient code. And then we'll talk about testing and my requirements for testing, writing one of these gems, and his requirements for writing an application that uses these distributed systems. So first, kind of textbook classroom, uh, what is a distributed system? Textbook definition, autonomous computers that work together to give the appearance of a single coherent system. So it's often referred to as uh, middleware because when you have these discrete elements of a system and um, little jargon, I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word node and server to describe the components of a distributed system. And it's basically interchangeable. A node is kind of a more abstract uh, con concept of a component, whereas the server is actually the actual machine. But I use them um, interchangeably. So um, when you have a distributed system, you have all these different nodes or servers. Um, but they're not a distributed system unless they have some kind of behavior, communication, way of agreeing, protocols, algorithms um, to glue them together and make them a, a single unit. So it's kind of middleware. It's software. Um, and that's why I use this um, image or metaphor of Cerberus. Um, if anybody's familiar with this, it's, he's actually a beast. So that works out quite well for this metaphor. And he has three heads. 
Um, but I use this image to represent the distributed system because Cerberus is a single unit. It's an entity. It's an animal. And it has different heads, so uh, different components of this beast exist. And it should be that this beast, this Cerberus, should lose one head, but the other two heads can step in and still be ferocious and defend the underworld as Cerberus is supposed to do. So some further textbook characterizations of a distributed system. Basically, it's about um, communication, that communication between components, nodes, servers, should be invisible to the user. So again, it's this idea of simplicity of an entity of a whole. Second, internal organization of these elements should be invisible to users. I shouldn't have to know where these nodes are, uh, what happens when one goes down, how they're interacting with each other. That's way too complex for bare um, code, as well as um, for anybody who's, who's using these distributed systems. It should be easy to scale. So Cerberus should um, just as easily have 300 heads as three heads. And components are independent. So any, <laughs> this, is kind of, this is when the metaphor becomes kind of weird, but if one head goes down, if one head's no longer available, then the other head should step in. So one component of the system should be able to fail, and the recovery should be seamless and invisible to the person using the distributed system. So this is my favorite slide in the entire presentation, because it basically sums up life. Nothing is reliable, and nothing is free. So these are false assumptions that if you made in the context of a distributed system, if you're writing software for a distributed system, or if you're writing an application that talks to a distributed system, both of those will fail if you make these assumptions. So basically, nothing's free, nothing's reliable, nothing's secure. So you have to uh, think about this when you're, when you're writing code that uses one of these entities, one of these systems. So keep that in mind. OK, so first concept of distributed systems is something called consensus. Consensus is about community, uh, communicating and reaching an agreement. So I'm going to jump into an example immediately, and then we'll step back and talk about the concepts a little bit more. This is using Elasticsearch. Um, so I'll have some code examples in the talk, and um, whether it's Elastic or MongoDB will be indicated in the corner. Um, terminology, node, I defined that already. Um, so it's an element of the distributed system. A shard in the context of Elasticsearch is a subdivision of an index. An index is kind of like a table in a relational database. It's a collection in MongoDB, so it's a, it's a collection of data. And uh, Elastic uh, subdivides it so that you can distribute it on different nodes and get um, scalability. So this example, um, it's the same operation in, in both uh, code blocks. First one, you create an index. And I say specifically, wait for active shards two. And it's a two-node cluster. So if both nodes are up and both nodes are available, I'll get a response back saying that both shards acknowledge this right. But if I kill one node, or if one node becomes unavailable, and I still say wait for active shards two, that says, again, do not return positive uh, results, positive result from this operation, do not confirm that it has actually been applied, unless two shards confirm that it has been applied. And if I killed one node, then that second shard's not available. And I'll get a response back saying shards acknowledged false. So the reason I say that this is consensus at work is because I killed the node, but I didn't tell the distributed system I killed the node. Consensus is communication and agreement. And the distributed system has figured out on its own that one node is not available. So it can return the appropriate response in this case. So that's consensus. That's, um, that's these nodes working together as a unit. More formally, consensus is used to achieve overall system reliability in the presence of a number of faulty processes. So consensus allows the system to detect failures and recover from them. More concretely, some applications of consensus outside that one example I showed are whether to commit a transaction to a database. So a transaction is committed to a database when all of the um, essential components confirm and agree that they're going to apply that change. Um, or something like choosing a new leader. So if you have a distributed system that has different roles, one of which is a leader, a primary, whatever you want to call it, um, consensus allows a distributed system to detect and agree amongst themselves who that new leader will be. 
More re real world applications are clock synchronization, a smart power grid, um, control of drones, and perhaps the more, most hip example is Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin uses proof of work to maintain consensus in a peer to peer network. So we have communication and we have agreement, but that's not the whole story. Being in sync is also important. Synchronization is using agreement to have the same information on the different components of the system. So this is a little abstract, so to make it more concrete, I want to talk about clock synchronization. Um, I didn't realize how complex time was until I started doing research for this presentation. Um, basically, time is made up, but it's loosely related to physics and nature and how the world turns and moves and the solar system and the cosmos. And so it's this, this tiny little thing where we have it on our, our wrists, we have it on our phone, I have it on my computer, I'm looking at it right now, but it's kind of made up and kind of arbitrary. So in a distributed system, it's very, very difficult to keep all of the components on the same page or, or, um, in relation to what they call wall clock times. A wall clock is what we recognize as time. It's the, the, the numerals that define time. Um, so what researchers did over years of research, and uh, dec sorry, decades of research, was to ask themselves a question, really back up and, and uh, make it a little bit more philosophical. And what they did was say, you know what? Like, what really is time? And I'm kind of getting tired of talking about distributed systems, so I thought we could switch gears and um, turn this presentation to a, <laughs> what is art? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, back to clocks. <laughs> so, you, <laughs> so what researchers did and what uh, distributed systems theory has converged towards is this idea of logical clocks. And logical clocks are really interesting because it's really about the ordering events. In a distributed system, it doesn't really matter what the absolute time is, what the wall clock time is, whether it matches what my iPhone says or what uh, one computer says versus another. It's really about the ordering of operations, reads, writes, everything in the system. So there's something called a logical clock, which I'm not going to go into the details of, but it's a, it's a way for the system to have an agreement uh, regarding the ordering of these operations. Okay, we have communication, we have agreement, we're in sync, but we need roles. In a distributed system, nothing will ever happen unless the, the nodes have um, different roles and different behaviors and ways of communicating with each other. So roles are determined by election algorithms. There are a number of them. Um, oh, I guess the there's supposed to be a circle or something around that. Um, the, so MongoDB uses the Raft algorithm. There, uh, there's a bully algorithm. There's um, a ring algorithm. But basically, what Bear needs to know about election algorithms is that each distributed system will have its own algorithm. And understanding a little bit, not all the details, because it can be really complex, knowing a little bit about what happens when a new, when one node with a certain role is no longer available and how a new one is elected will help Bear interpret the errors coming back from the distributed system when he makes requests and gets particular errors. Um, but and basically, like the way that these these um, election algorithms differ is how they resolve certain problems with uh, with um, elections. Like for example, in a distributed system, you can have something called a partition, which is where the different nodes in the system uh, kind of split. There's a network split, and they don't um, they're not able to talk to the other subdivision of the system, and um, and so. Uh, the election algorithms uh, take that into account and know how to recover from a situation like that. Another thing is called a split brain, which is where you have this partition and um, uh, leaders elected in each one of those groups, and then there's no authority to be able to merge them back together. Kind of sounds like politics. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the other, another thing is uh, like what happens if you elect a primary, a leader, but the data it has is out, out of date, it's stale. All this stuff is taken into account in uh, election algorithms. So um, we looked at this code before, and um, this is where an electron algorithm might be uh, useful to be familiar with, with the distributed system that Bear is using. He does the ping, um, an election happens, but if an election happens, what kind of error will he get back? What is the behavior of the client that he's using if it thinks it's talking to the primary that can take rights, but then when it actually does make that request, it's no longer the primary? What kind of error will he get back, and how can he recover from it? or recover his own application code from that. Can he retry? 
we'll look at that later. So communication, synchronization, agreement, roles. What about reliability? How can we beef up this system to make it more resilient? You achieve that by a number of things. One is replication. That's when you, um, that's this concept of uh, writing data to a certain element of the system and allowing it to propagate to the other members of the system. And when you have replication, of course, that introduces a whole slew of problems, one of which is how do you maintain consistency? Consistency is this um, idea, I mean, it's what it sounds like. Consistency is how do you how do you make sure that when data is written to the system, one member of the system, that as quickly as possible or, or according to some rules, that that data actually ends up on all of the other members of the system if it needs to, and how long does that take? And in particular, what types of deviations are you willing to tolerate? What types of deviations is the distributed system willing to tolerate? And what types of deviations is the application bears code willing to tolerate when it, it uh, sends new data or makes an update to the system? So these axes of deviation are staleness. So that has to do with the logical clock, actually. So um, how out of date can one member be? Um, also, you have numerical deviation, which is not so common, but it basically is, uh, like with stocks, for example, it allows um, there to be some deviation in the actual value of something, numerical value. And then this one's a little bit more difficult to, un to explain, but it's um, ordering of update operations. So essentially, you have a series of update operations, and you can define within a certain series how many, um, how much um, non-ordering are you willing to tolerate. But when you have, so when you have this problem with consistency, the way to handle it is to develop consistency models. The best you can do is, is make some promises and keep those promises. And so at least it's clear what, what promises you're not making. <laughs> so um, this is not casual consistency, it's causal consistency. <laughs> and causal consistency is one consistency model. And it basically makes a promise like this. If process one writes x equals one, process two reads x equal one and x equals three, and then writes x equal three, process three, if the first process and process two are causally consistent, process three absolutely must read the state in process one followed by the state in process two, never out of order. It's a little bit abstract, which is essentially relating um, some kind of vector between events in the system. And if you make these kinds of guarantees, you can, um, you, you can make sure that whoever is using the distributed system is kind of on the same page and is not surprised by any out-of-date data. <laughs> I guess the slides didn't really want to stay around. <laughs> um, and this is, so this is where uh, Bear's knowledge of causal consistency is actually quite useful. With MongoDB, you can actually start a session using the client that you get through the gem, the Mongo gem, and you say that causal consistency true. So what that means is all of the operations that I do with, or Bear does, with this session um, are never going to be seen by that client out of order. So the results of the operations done with that client using that session um, can be guaranteed that they have some inherent ordering, regardless of what the distributed system is doing, what kind of elections happen, what kind of network outages you have, anything. This is my favorite kind of um, consistency, if one can have favorite kinds of causal cons of uh, consistency models. So in English, eventual means something will happen, you just don't really know when. It will happen at some undetermined um, point in time. I know other languages, I think in French and German, eventual kind of means maybe, but that in English, eventual really means like, like, later. <laughs> and I like this one because it sounds like nonsense. And I really wish that I could live my life like this. And for example, if my manager said, hey, Emily, when do you think you can resolve this bug? And if I could respond eventually, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, so, but okay, so those, those consistency models, causal consistency and eventual consistency, really concern the distributed system and how what kind of guarantees are maintained within the system itself. But you can also kind of uh, move it over towards the client and say, you know what, within the system, it doesn't really matter uh, like, um, whether how consistent the nodes are with each other as long as one single client with its view has some guarantees. And that's what you call client 
concentric consistency. So this is where it's more relevant to bear here. Um, if uh, the client that he's using uh, can provide some of these guarantees, like monotonic reads, monotonic writes, I'm not going to define all of this, but essentially um, what's important to understand for Bear is that the concept of client-centric consistency is there, and it basically scopes the, the um, sequence of events and the results of those events in the system to a single client. And it doesn't matter what other clients are doing. So our last major, major subject in the theory of distributed systems is called fault tolerance. What fault tolerance allows the system to do is recover when one of those Cerberus heads goes down. And that's achieved in, by a number of ways. First, defining the types of faults you can get in a system allows you to recover from them. So you can have transient faults, which are basically like a blip in the network. A blip is like what it sounds like, it's a little glitch in the matrix, something that happens like that, and then doesn't come back. Intermittent faults are ones that happen, they could be blips, like little glitches in the matrix, but they actually come back uh, for some period of time, and they're intermittent, they happen with some interval, but within overall, within the same period of time. And then permanent is when somebody steps on your network cable or the server gets coffee spilled on it or there's a hurricane. And I, I say this hurricane thing because <laughs> I have a colleague in Australia and he always says that, I mean, when we try to have meetings and there's a storm, he just can't join the meeting. It's like weather has a huge effect on his network there for some reason. And he said it's quite common in Australia. So very aware of uh, weather <laughs> effects on networks <laughs> these days. Uh, so you can really have some permanent outages and that's a totally different type of fault and, and you handle in a much different way. So the way you achieve fault tolerance when you have these different kinds of faults is in a number of ways. One is redundancy, so having uh, two heads in the Cerberus that have the same data and same, um, the same copy of the data, they're consistent with each other, so that one, if one is no longer available, the other one can step in and take over. And the way you recover is by having this system either move forwards into a new state or backwards into a previous state. So that sums up all the theory on distributed systems. Um, I think what Bear can understand by now is that distributed systems are actually quite complex. And we're going to now look at his code, kind of the beauty side of the story, and look at how smart code or clever code can make distributed systems more simple for him. So the beauty. Again, this is my favorite slide. Sums up life. Nothing is free, nothing is reliable, nothing is secure. Um, and I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that these false assumptions will make the distributed system fail if it's in the context of a distributed system, but it will also make an application fail if these assumptions are made. So it's really important for Bear also to understand that he cannot make these assumptions about his distributed system because the distributed system doesn't even make those assumptions. So keep those in mind when we look at his code and the types of errors that he can get when he makes requests to the system. First, errors. There are two major categories of errors. There are network errors and there are operation errors. Network errors can come in the form of a blip, as I said, it's this little thing that happens like that and doesn't come back. But the thing about a blip is that the blip can happen, now this is from Bear's perspective. perspective. The, bear, the blip can happen on its way from the application to the server or on the way back. And how, how do you tell? How do you know? Does anybody know? You can't tell, <laughs> it's a trick question. Uh, so this is really important for Bear to know if he wants to retry, that, that the danger of this is that the update actually got to the database. So he can't just blindly retry when he gets a network error, because it actually might write duplicate data and compromise the integrity of his data. Oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> the second type of network error that you can get is an outage. And that's this whole hurricane thing I'm talking about. So that's when the network goes down and there's no recovering from it within a reasonable amount of time, or a ti amount of time that the person using your application, so now we're taking even a further step back. We have the application, the distributed system, and the browser, so the user. The network outage cannot recover or be recovered from within the amount of time that that user is willing to wait. So network outage is that the update tries to make it to the database and, um, and it doesn't make it there because of this outage and there's kind of no point in retrying within a reasonable amount of time because 
you don't know when the network will be available again. So the second category are operation errors. This is an example of an operation error. Um, it's a not authorized error. So it's as if you sent a write, in the case of MongoDB, to a secondary, which is a type of um, node in a replica set, a, a cluster of MongoDB, that cannot take writes. And if you do that, you'll get an error saying not authorized. Sorry. That whole description was for this slide. So ignore what I just said. <laughs> not primary is the error you get back when you write to a secondary. This one is obviously when you're not authorized to do the operation. So those are operation errors. And there, of course, there are lots of different types of, uh, types of operation errors, and they depend, de de depend on the distributed system you're using and what kind of um, behavior and APIs it exposes. So <clears throat> we know about, so we've categorized errors, network errors, and operation errors. Um, but what's now really relevant to Bear is um, how, do you, how do you retry? How do you handle these errors? Can, does he have to just kind of um, abort the, the work that he's trying to do? Or can he uh, cleverly retry after evaluating what kind of error he gets back from his request? But what's important for him to know is that the client, and so now I'm talking about the gems that I've worked on, the client doesn't know what your application is doing. I have no idea if the operation that Bear is trying to make is updating someone's profile picture or trying to put money in someone's bank account. And I'm not going to make that call because that's, I, I, I can't make that call. I don't know the context, and I'm not going to try to know the context. So it's not. I'm not able in my code to determine when it's safe to retry. That's really up to the application developer who has the business logic and the context of the work that they're trying to do. So let's look at an, an example of Bear's code. This is using MongoDB. Um, it's an update operation. And the way updates work in MongoDB is you have a query, and then you have um, some kind of write that happens on the, um, in this case, it'll happen to uh, one because um, you specify the only one. one ma the first matching document will receive this update. And when you look at this, um, MongoDB has atomic writes. So no operations can happen between the matching of this document and the write. Um, and that will be important later on. But what Bear has to do when he looks at this and say, like, what could possibly go wrong? And to answer this question, we need to go back to our categories of errors. The first one are network errors. So in the case of this operation, if there's a network blip, What's going to happen? How can he retry this code? What options does he have? Ideally, he would just retry once. And because it's a network blip, the second request will go through. So that's fine. In the case of a network outage, what can he do? What kind of retry try behavior can he have? He would probably want to retry um, for a reasonable amount of time or a reasonable number of times. So you can retry with a limit. And as I said before, you would want to retry um, so that the user who's um, using your application via the browser or whatever um, is not waiting too long for whatever they're trying to do to happen. So you can have retry a numerical limit, so retry five times, or a um, time limit, retry for five seconds. Operation errors, uh, this kind of error, not authorized, you wouldn't want to retry because there's, retrying a not authorized error isn't going to change anything. And if you're not authorized to do a certain write and you retry and then you are suddenly authorized to do that write, there's definitely something wrong. Um, and then this example of not primary, what would you do here? If it's an election, presumably, at some point in the future, there will be a new primary, a new node available to take that right. So you might want to wait a little bit and then retry. So looking at, looking at all these different types of errors and all these different retry behaviors that Bear can do, how do, we, how do we write one single line of code or maybe a couple of lines of code that accounts for the majority of cases? I don't want to write all of these begin rescues, and it's going to, for every single operation, it would be way too complex to do that. So there is something with Bear's knowledge of the distributed system and how it works now and the types of errors that he can get that he can do to make it so that one bit of code will succeed as in the majority of cases. And the key to that is something called idempotent operations. Who knows what idempotent means? 
Who wants to define what it means? Go. <laughs> Right. Um, if anybody knows Latin, it comes from Latin, and it basically means uh, one power. So it's um, exactly as Toby said, it's uh, an operation that regardless of the number of times it's applied, the, the result of the operation will only ever happen once. So to make this more concrete, um, this is really important for Bear to understand, to know how to safely retry writes, which change data. This is using MongoDB. Um, and it's a little bit of pseudocode, so ignore this kind of like non-Ruby syntax retry then raise. Um, so basically, uh, what you can do using that update operation we looked at before is create a unique value and then match on the ID, the query criteria that you're looking for, and use this data structure you can have within a document with MongoDB called a set, and it's a set, so unique values. And you add pending and that unique value. And then you can retry this once because it's just you know, it's just writing this, so it doesn't really matter if you do retry that once. So that's step one. Step two is to do the update and pass in your query criteria, the unique value, and in the update, and as I said before, it's atomic. Atomic means um, it's kind of an isolated operation. So nothing can happen between the matching of this document and the, the, the write. So when you match on this unique pending value, and you pull that value from the set, and then you do your increment, you can only ever do that once. Because nothing can come be in between this. So if you do it once, and then you retry and you do it twice, it won't match the document, because the, pending, the unique value is no longer there. So this operation is unimpotent. And as we look at retry behavior, we'll see that this is the key to being able to safely retry. And just to be fair, we're going to look at an Elasticsearch example. And it actually makes it a little bit easier. So with Elasticsearch, you can, uh, um, you can take advantage of something in Elasticsearch that, that MongoDB doesn't have, where it versions documents. So <coughs> this is also two steps. First step, you query for the document. Then you get the, the version number. And in the second step, you can use that version as the query criteria. So if the update is actually applied and you try to do it again, the second request will not match. You'll actually get an error like this. If, I, if that first operation was applied and then I do it again and I match again on version 1, I'll get this error. Current version 2, because it is currently view uh, 2, is different than the one provided, 1. So that's how you can do Elasticsearch operations idempotently. OK. so. Now we're going to talk about gem APIs. And I, I really want to point out gem APIs because I put in a lot of work and effort to expose behavior and options to the user community that makes it easier for them to write this strategic code and easier for them to write the simple code that interacts with this distributed system. And in particular, I am encouraging Bear to um, Look into, I mean, he doesn't have to read all the source code, but just really look at the behavior of the client when there's a network blip. What kind of error is raised from the client? Does the client itself retry? I know the MongoDB client um, retries on a read once, and you can actually configure it. Um, what happens if the primary is unavailable? If the distributed system cannot take a write, what, what kind of errors is raised by the client? What kind of behavior does it have? I know MongoDB has its own particular behavior. Um, that, for better or worse, is uh, pretty opaque to the user. But it's important for Bear to understand this, so he knows that if there's suddenly a, um, like a five-second delay in an operation, that the client actually might be trying to find the primary. And he might have some control over how long that takes. What happens if there's a network outage, an operation failure, et cetera? It's really important to know the gem that you're using, because um, I mean, so Elastic is, um, H uh, communicates over HTTP. So you can just use an uh, HTTP client and uh, make requests to Elasticsearch. Um, so why would you use a client? You use a client because you get all of this. 
I write code that knows Elasticsearch so that I can expose an API and experience to users that makes sense. So it's not just raw requests going through. And with MongoDB, um, it doesn't use HTTP. It uses its own wire protocol. And so it's even an even more kind of opaque um, way of communicating with the server, because you absolutely cannot make requests in MongoDB unless you construct um, messages according to certain rules and a, a protocol. Um, but the same reason, the why would you use a client? Well, it's because of this wire protocol with MongoDB, but also because it, it under the client knows the way the distributed system behaves and exposes options and behavior for and errors for the user for Bear, so that he can write better code. And in specifically, um, this is kind of a mashup of both Elasticsearch and MongoDB options, uh, client options. Um, heartbeat frequency, for example, is on the MongoDB driver, the client. And it essentially um, dictates how often the client pings the server to make sure it's up and healthy. Um, so that obviously has an effect on um, the overhead of an application, but it also will make the client um, aware of changes in the distributed system, change in roles, for example, much more quickly than a client that's pinging it every minute. Um, sniffing is Elasticsearch kind of uh, a client looking at the state of the distributed system and adapting to changes. Things like connection timeouts, um, server selection timeout is something specific to MongoDB. It's a timeout um, that determines how long the client is willing to spend to try to find a particular member of the distributed system with the role that you're looking for. So a, a replica set with MongoDB can either be nodes that take writes or nodes that take reads. Uh, the, the one that takes writes takes reads as well. But you can route queries to secondaries. So if you specifically, sorry, secondary is the, the read type of node. Um, so the server selection timeout will have a huge effect on how the application performs and how long a certain request um, is allowed to take. And the last topic that I want to tell Bear about is testing. Testing against a single server running on localhost isn't sufficient. And I say this to myself, too, because I love testing my gems on localhost, because <laughs> it's so easy and everything passes. <laughs> but I don't know if you recognize this slide, but this is my favorite slide again. <laughs> Third time. <laughs> um, so this slide is here now because um, you cannot make these assumptions with your tests either. So if these, all of these things are possible in your distributed system in production, then why not test them? So if we look at some equivalences, topology does not change. Force the topology change in your tests. What do I mean about that? Um, if you have a replica set, what happens, yeah, like with MongoDB, you can actually like um, on the fly change the roles of, of nodes within the replica set and make it a single server um, replica set um, on the fly without stopping any processes and restarting them. Um, what other, there, I mean, uh, use a network, not local host. You turn authentication on. That will affect performance of your tests as well, and it's really important to test like that. Use a heterogeneous network. I've been thinking a lot about all of this lately, a lot, because I'm uh, building um, some infrastructure at Elastic to uh, allow the clients to test to benchmark against Elasticsearch. And I've had a lot of discussions about network latency and how do you run benchmark tests using a network, but ensuring that the network latency is consistent from benchmark run to benchmark run. And it's not easy. And this kind of stuff made me think about how I'm actually just testing the, the client on a daily basis and how important it is for me to introduce some of these variables. Like, like kill a node when I'm running my test. Like, how do my tests perform when that happens? And making sure I really control some of these, um, these faults or errors that can happen with your distributed system. So Bear's feeling a little overwhelmed right now, but he's kind of excited because he feels like he can go back to his application and take his new knowledge and apply it and write more resilient code and not have to, uh, and Betsy gave a talk yesterday, excellent talk, by the way, um, and she mentioned emergency learning. And I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm guilty of emergency learning because it is a necessity. It's not, it's not something you should be apol apologized for doing. But I think a lot of times with things like this, like, like network errors or distributed system issues, we kind of emergency learn and don't really think about the big picture. But hopefully with all this knowledge, we can go back and write code that really accounts for the uh, more situations and can handle things a little bit more seamlessly and elegantly. 
Um, but Bear actually texted me this morning, and he said, <laughs> um, I have a quick question. Apparently, the team is having an issue with race conditions persisting to Redis. Would you consider wrapping the Redis persistence code in a mutex? Just wondering if that would make sense. So what questions do we have for Bear? What, what would you ask him to debug this? I need, I need some help running response. <laughs> OK. Um, I would say, what is your Redis topology like? So OK, you have a race condition. What kind of thing are you talking to? Is it a single server? That will help us narrow down the possibility of uh, like the location or the, the source of this race condition. Um, does Redis guarantee order of write operations? I don't really know that much about Redis, even though I had it in my NoSQL class last year. Um, did some emergency learning to teach that class. Um, <laughs> what is the client you're using guarantee? What is the behavior of the client that you're using? Who is initiating the request? Is it a single client? Or are there multiple clients, and then there's something else that's checking that these things have, ha have actually happened in order? Um, is it a user, internal process? Has there been any failovers or change of state um, in the Redis servers, uh, like assuming that, that um, you're not just talking to a single server? So these are all questions that, with this knowledge of distributed systems and theory, will help you, you ask yourself and um, be able to resolve some errors in a more uh, global way and anticipate these kinds of errors in the future. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure if I have time. Do I have time? No, maybe. Elastic is hiring. <laughs> we have so many languages at the company. And it's purely remote, by the way. So you can work from here. Hi. <laughs> I hope it was better the second time. <laughs> Oh, did I miss it? Um, I think, yeah, yeah, so in this case, um, it, like, so if you don't match this document, It'll create a document with this ID with counter one. But you can actually do it again. It's not item potent because if you, so if I did this again, it would just match on the ID and um, the counter would be two. So it's, it's, huh? Oh, you missed the incremental part. Okay. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here's our little gift for you. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome and thank you for joining us.